When I was five years old, they removed my arms. It was my birthday party, and I was super excited with the new present that I had just gotten from my mom. Excitement was flowing through my body. And I was running from one side of the room to the other side of the room. I was talking to everyone. When I saw my uncle coming towards me, he approached me, he bent down, and he said, Diego, stop shaking your hands like a girl. And that was the day that I started to restrain my movement. When I was eight, they silenced me. The boys in the back of the classroom used to laugh every time I said something. According to them, my voice was too feminine. So, I learned to measure every tone of voice, every word, every sentence that I said, until I stopped speaking. When I was 10, they removed my legs. I was in school, paying attention to a class, and under the blue desk, I had my legs crossed. When the teacher came to me and she said, Diego, why don't you sit like a proper man? I didn't know what she meant, but for many years, I didn't cross my legs again. Before I realized, they removed all my dreams. I wanted to travel the world, to have a successful career, to do important things. But when I looked around me, there were very few people like me. The closest reference that I had, it was a ridiculous comedy character in a TV show. Little by little, they removed every part of me. They changed my hairstyle, the music I used to like, the clothes that I used to wear. I still remember using a black T-shirt of a rock band that I didn't even like, just to fit in. Until one day, I looked at myself in the mirror and I asked, who are you? What's left? And there was nothing left. After my adolescence, I was completely in pieces. I hated everything. I hated everyone. But mostly, I hated myself. But everything started to change when I received an opportunity to start all over again, from scratch. I was accepted in one of the best universities in my country, Brazil, studying in the following year. The academic achievement was just an excuse behind the real reason for my excitement. I wanted to start a new life. So I packed up my pain and all my dreams, and I went to the city that would change my life forever. In Rio, I met people like me, and I learned the importance of role models. I met Pedro, my loyal friend, that had a childhood story so similar to mine that I couldn't even believe it. I met Fernando, another friend that could light up a full room just with his smile. I was introduced to uncountable other people that showed me without saying anything that I wasn't alone. So by the age of 20, I took the most important decision of my life. I finally left all my rock band t-shirts in the closet. <laughs> and I came out. The first person I came out to was my mom. 
And I remember that day as if it was yesterday. I came back from the weekends at home, and she was cooking at the kitchen, our dinner. When I stopped by the door, and she started to talk and talk and talk about her day like any other ordinary day. Until after some minutes with no response, she understood that was not another ordinary day. Some moments changed the course of our lives forever, and I knew that was one of them. So I took her by the hand, we went to the living room, we sat in this brown sofa that we had all my life, and I told her the words that I struggled for so many years to say. I said, Mom, I'm gay. And after that moment, I can only remember two things. The warm hug that she gave me, that I could feel that the whole world just could fit in her arms on that moment. And the words that she said to me. She said, my son, I just want you to find happiness. I don't mind about your ways to get there. That was one of the hardest but most beautiful moments of my life. And then after that, little by little, I started to release my movements. I started to dance. I started to exercise to feel comfortable with my body. I learned to speak. And I learned to say no. And I learned to say yes. And trust me, something magical happens when you decide to say yes to life. I had beautiful relationships that showed me that I could also be loved. I lived in six countries. I met amazing people. I was hired by top-notch companies that valued my work and my perspectives. I had an extraordinary life. But can I be honest to you? Deep inside me, sometimes, I still feel like something is wrong. No matter all my achievements, no matter all the things that I overcame, sometimes when I look around, I still feel like a misfit. In every achievement, there is this voice telling me, this time was pure luck. In every trial, you're not going to get it. In every dream, there is this voice telling me, This is too big for you. Who do you think you are? And this voice, this voice is not from my uncle. It's not from the boys in the back of the classroom. This voice is not from my teacher. This voice is from a scared little boy that learned to hate himself. How many barriers in my life, how many misconceptions about me, how many things I lost because of him. Him, that boy. It's interesting how I talk about my younger self in the third person, right? It seems that in one moment I wanted to create this wall to pretend that he never existed, to delete him from my memory. But now... I understand that past, present, and future, they are all interconnected. There there will be a lot of that boy living in me forever. So instead of pushing him away and try to neglect his existence, I decided to embrace him. I decided to actively talk to him, to listen to him, to acknowledge his fears, but mostly, I decided to write another story about that boy. At the end of the day, we are all storytellers of our own lives. What we do is, out of years and years of chaotic experience, we pick some moments, some feelings, some meanings, and we put in this package that we call ourselves. And with this package, we create a narrative about who we are, 
where we come from, why we think the way that we think. There's a field in psychology called narrative identity. Basically, narrative identity explained by uh, psychologist Dan McAdams is a person's internalized and evolving story, integrating the reconstructed past and imagined future to provide life with some degree of unity and purpose. At the end of the day, we're all wanting this degree of who we are, this shape, and we create stories to determine this shape. What's interesting about his research is that he says that people that find outcomes, uh, happy outcomes of moments of suffering, redemption of moments of pain, that tell these stories of good outcomes, they enjoy better lives, more mental health, they enjoy a, a, more, a better sense of maturity than the others that tell a different story in a negative way. There's a quote in a movie that I really love that is heard by Spike Jonze that says, the past is just a story we tell ourselves. This is beautiful. <laughs> the past is just a story we tell ourselves. And if this, the past is a story, I can tell it in different ways. I can look at that same boy that for so many years I was taught to see as inferior, as not capable, and I can find him a new meaning. Instead of weakness and pain, I can find those moments again. I can look there and I can find millions of examples of his authenticity, of his strength, of his resilience. The same boy that fell so many times was the same boy that had to stand up day after day for his existence. Now, whenever I'm in a room that I don't feel I'm good enough, I look at that boy. I look at all the things he overcame, all the things he achieved, and he gives me the strength to move on. Step by step, that boy is becoming my closest friend. He's here with me today, a little bit scared, but extremely proud of the places that I haven't taken him. Step by step, I'm creating another narrative for my life story. Now, I want to ask you, what is the life that you're building for yourself? Thank you. <laughs>